It is Wednesday afternoon, October 18th. We're picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 27, almost to the end of it, starting at just approximately at um, verse 44. To give the backdrop to it, Yaakov, Jacob, has received the blessing that was to be given to the younger son, he being the younger son. Esau thought he had it sealed up, thought it was going to be his. He's exploded over the loss of it. He blames his brother for it, saying his brothers cheated him out of it, which we know is not true. Not only did God say it belonged to Jacob, but Esau even sold it. He gave it up. Whether he thought that he could get away with that or not doesn't matter. It was not his from the get-go. So <laughs> even though he should have realized and accepted and received blessing also, God wasn't leaving him out to a, a horrible life. And he did receive blessing excuse me, from the Lord also, but the greater going to Yaakov, he's, and he knowing that he has been subjugated to his brother, that his, Jacob's brothers are to be servants for him, he's not willing for that, his attitude has gone from bad to worse, and in verse 43, I think it must be, um, oh, verse 43, Rebecca is telling Jacob, your brother wants to kill you, and that's my point. He was willing, rather than to have Jacob over him, I'll just kill him. I'll just get rid of him. So he's become, I don't know, vindictive, neurotic. He's just, he's gone over the edge with it. It's not, he's not accepting his lot as he should. <clears throat> so Rebecca doesn't want her son in danger. She doesn't want her other son to be able to kill this son. She loves them both. So she's telling Jacob, go. Um, verse 43, to flee to Haran, go to her brother Levon, Laban. She's there to go back where they came from. Remember when Isaac needed a bride, Abraham sent the servant back to this area, back to Haran, the area of Padan Aram, and we'll talk about that area, to get a wife for Isaac. He wasn't to take a wife from the area because even though they've come into the land of promise, the people in that land are not godly people. So Isaac could marry an ungodly woman and carry on the godly line down to Messiah. Jacob's in that same place. So Rebecca's saying, go to my brother. Go back to family. Stay with him for a few days until your brother's fury subsides. Those few days are going to turn out to be about 21, 22 years, depending on how long the traveling took place, because he's with Levon, Laban for 20 years. We know that from Genesis chapter 31 and verse 41. So we'll be with Laban also for the next few <laughs> classes in this time. As far as we know, Rebecca and Jacob didn't get to see each other again on this earth. So there was sorrow that came out of the, the, the fact that Rebecca took it into her own hands. At the same time, it was not judgment that, that you know, you did wrong, you're judged harshly. No. No, but in our circumstances, when we do take things into our own hands, there will be consequences. If she had left it in God's hands, it might not have come to dealing with the separation. Even though we see God's perfect will, because Jacob's wife was waiting for him back in where they're going. As we move forward, we're going to see that we are actually we're going to not see. <laughs> there is no judgment given on Jacob and Rachel that you were the two bad ones and, and boom, you know, this, this here's the judgment for it. We don't read that. In fact, as I challenge you in my text today, how does Jacob go out? Does he go out under the judgment of God or does he go out under the hand of blessing from God? And we'll answer that as we go along in these verses. Notice what happens from the hand of his father and from the hand of his heavenly father. Keep that in your mind, and you'll see that very soon if you don't know, if you haven't read ahead. <laughs> okay, now, <clears throat> um, again, she doesn't want to be bereaved of both. We looked last week, we don't know if she was saying, I don't want to be bereaved of my husband, because Esau was saying, as soon as dad dies, I'll kill my brother. So the two that she was referring to could be her husband and Jacob. Or it could be that if Esau did take things in his own hands, we saw from the scriptures that his life could be taken from him because he's brought murder on someone else. 
and God's judgment was there for that. The, there was the capital punishment, so to speak, to put it in a nutshell. We looked at the verses last week that backed that up. We don't know which she's referring to, but she knows she's got a problem on her hands, and she's got to convey to her husband also, we've got to do something about this. So first she tells um, Jacob to go and to flee, to stay until this changes, till um, verse 45, till your brother's anger against you subsides, he forgets what you did to him, then I'll send word, I'll get you from there, why should I lose you both in one day? That's what we're talking about. So, now Rebecca needs to turn to her husband Isaac. She's, she needs a reason for why she's sending Jacob away. And this is what she brings to him. And it's truth. It's not just, you know, it, it, it coming up with something. This is truth. She says in verse 46, I'm tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. The daughters of Heth were Esau's two wives. Okay, he'd already married two ungodly women. If Yaakov, if Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, and that's who was around him, if he falls in love with one of these gals, and he marries her, one of these from the daughters of the Lamb here, what good will my life be to me? Isaac, think, when you pass away, the brother is to take care of the mother. Esau is going to be the one there. Jacob's having to flee. If Esau's two wives have a say in it, they're not going to be leading and taking care of her and concerned about her in a godly way. They're ungodly women. There's probably no morals there and no care there. And if Jacob is still in the picture, even though he has that spiritual mind, if his little wifey's, wifey <laughs> gives him grief over mom, where's, where's it going to side? There'll be war. There'll be contention. There'll be fighting. And I can't even think of my son, who is spiritually minded, being matched with someone who is not. Where will that lead? And we know it would not be a good, a clean, a pure line to the Messiah then if that happened. So she had every right to feel that way, to be looking at her future and to realize we've got an issue here. We need to get our son the right type of wife. We need to get him a spiritual wife. After all, remember what was Rebecca? She was the sought-after spiritual wife for Isaac. Remember, Abraham had to be concerned. Who is my son going to marry? And he sent the servant to go back to where the word of God was, to go back to a family that does have the truth in them. We see Rebecca comes out. We don't read that she had to come out of ungodly ways and she had to get right with God and then she could be made right for Isaac. She was ready for Isaac. She was ready to be the spiritual wife that he needed. And they carried on and, and to some degree raised their children in it. I say to some degree, they did raise their children in it. To some degree, one child accepted it, one child did not. Let me just put it that way. Uh, because we know that Jacob had the spiritual band and had the love for the Lord where Esau had the love for the world. So... Um, she goes to Isaac, I think we're, well, I think I've said it. I already turned my page in my Bible. So, you know, we need to send our son to go get a wife. Now, really, at this point, Isaac should have thought to himself, wow, my dad and my mom looked out for me. They sent and they got. They took care of it. I've been negligent. I haven't taken care of getting right wives for my children. My son Esau is already married too. He shouldn't have. And now, yes, I need to be concerned about who Jacob will marry. So, um, when we see the daughters of Heth, also let me bring to your attention that is the Hittites. Okay, Heth was a shorter form of the word. Um, we read about them in chapter 25. Let me just refresh your mind quickly. Go with me to Genesis chapter 25. I may have to punt back and use my um, Bible, my hard copy. Yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble. Sorry, folks. I'm going to go back to 25. There we go. See if I can get my tablet to work better. I have no idea why it's not. Lord, touch it. <laughs> Chapter 25, verse 9 and 10. Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, facing Mamre, the field which Abraham had purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah, and then it goes on, you know, where, where they went. So the Hittites were prominent in Canaan. The Canaan. If, if Jacob chose a wife from around him, he probably would have married a Hittite. 
that's what's got to not happen. Archaeology reveals to us that the Hittites were prominent in this area in two different periods of time, from 2000 BC to 1800 BC, and then again they were very prominent and strong 1400 BC to 1200 BC. Now, real quick just to prove, archaeology proving the Word of God, Avraham was born somewhere between 2100 BC and 2000 BC. We know that he was a hundred when he had Isaac. So Isaac was born between 2000 BC and 1900 BC. Now, we know that Isaac had Jacob and Esau when he was 60. He was 40 when he married Rebecca, but he was 60 when the twins were born. So that makes the twins born somewhere between 1940 and 1840 BC. Now come up with Esau and his age. He was 40 years old when he marries the Hittite women, and that makes him marrying them somewhere between 1900 and 1800 BC. And that just happens to coincide with archaeology saying that's when the Hittites were prominent in the land. So it backs up the word of God, that this is the people who are all around them, and it's at the time that God said in the scriptures. i just like to show you how everything does nothing but prove the word of God. Never, never against. It always ends up proving the word of God. So uh, I think I've covered that. Oh, let me point out also, was there a question, comment? What about 35, 27 of Genesis in this same... 46 verse, so what you're talking about, you said 25, 9 to 10, and you also got 35, 27. We'll get to that one. We're oh. not there yet. Yeah, that's showing us. In fact, we can go ahead since you brought it up. 35, 27 tells us there's no, no mention of Rebecca there, so she probably had already died by that point. Um, remember, again, she was concerned that she might be left as a widow with her her um, daughters-in-law and that was her concern but we see apparently she even died before that happened we don't read that that um, she was alive after Isaac but that she had died before well, so God took care of it. yeah God took care of it more ways than one but just as a side note of interest when Yeshua was on the cross he turned to John Yochanan his beloved uh, Talmud disciple at a point in time, his mother Miriam, or Mary as you call her, was right there. And the Lord said to John, Behold your mother, and to the mother, Behold your son. Probably what was prevalent on his mind at that point wasn't just that she needed an arm around her watching what was going on and to comfort her, to help her, but he probably was placing on Yochanan his responsibility. He was the oldest son. He was looking out for his, what we believe was widowed mother, because we don't read about his, the earthly father, Joseph, that she was married to before, uh, that, that came together um, when she was, was pregnant with Yeshua. You know what I'm talking about. I'm getting too complicated. But um, we don't read about him later. So it's presumed that he was not in the scene because he had died. So Yeshua would have stepped into that role, the oldest son looking out for his widowed mother all her life. Now he's not going to be able to do that in the physical. As God, of course, he can. But in the physical, the responsibility of the Jewish son looking out for his widowed mother, he turned that responsibility over to Yochanan. It's probably why he said that at that time, and he knew who would be responsible, who would put an arm around her, take her into his house, and see to her every day that she lived on this earth. Just a side note, but I, I do believe that's why we see that in the scripture, even just showing that, um, that Yeshua lived that Jewish way of life, you know, and was taking care of his responsibility. So, now I think I'm ready for 28. Have I told it all to you? I think I have. Okay. Okay, I don't see anything else at this point, so I'm going to believe I did. <laughs> so, what, so uh, what, uh, what about 49, 30 to 31? That's the only mention that we have. Let's see if I can get my tablet to go there. It is. That's the only mention that we have of Rebecca in death. And, whoops, 
I put in the wrong chapter, I put in 249. There's not that many in Genesis. Um, and, and that's where she's mentioned to have already passed away, so that's why we think we just don't have her death recorded. Um, Genesis 49, verses 30 and 31, In the cave that's in the field of Machpelah, which is opposite Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Avraham bought along, from, bought along with the field from Ephron the Hittite as a burial site. Okay, we're talking about the same place, what we just read about in chapter 35, what we read about previously in Genesis. That plot that Abraham bought to bury his, oh, yeah. his wife Sarah, okay? That same place, the field in the cave that's in it, purchased from the sons of Heth. Um, I skipped, I'm sorry, I missed verse 31. There they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife Rebekah. And Jacob speaking, he says there he buried Leah. So, and later Jacob's buried there. So the six of them are buried there. The one exception is Rachel. She will be buried on the way to Jerusalem outside of what was Bethlehem at that time. So they weren't in there yet. They were close, just a few miles from there. Um, she dies on the road. She's buried on the road. Her sepulcher is with us to this day. In spite of the fact that they try to say it's a Muslim mosque, it's always been a Jewish grave site. It was there... Let's see, I'm going to say approximately 2,600 years before there was a Muslim religion that could have a mosque. Amazing how something 2,600 years older could then have been a mosque. <laughs> okay, I think you get my point. But that's our only mention of Rebecca's death, that she was buried there in the cave of Machpelah, and by the time Jacob's telling it, it's, it's happened. It's, but Isaac's death, everything has already been there, too. I see wheels turning. No, okay. Okay, I don't know if I confused everybody or not. So at this point, Rebecca is still alive. But we do read of the fact that she had died. We just don't read of her death. Okay? Okay, now I just have a question. But Rebecca was not alive when Jacob came back. Right. Correct. Yeah. We don't read it of her being there, so yeah. we presume that she had not. And we do read of Jacob being reunited with Rebecca's um, handmaid, Deborah, I think is the name. Don't quote me. Sometimes I have to think what's in our, our um, Jewish commentaries and what's in the Word of God. I'll have to look back at that, but it does, it, it does speak of her, her right-hand person. And you would think if she were alive, she would have been in that picture. So the, the lack of speaking speaks to the fact that they, that they had passed away. But for whatever reason, God did not feel it was needful for us to have the facts of her death and burial. Just lets us know that's where she was buried. So we don't know exactly when it happened or, or any of the details. But to our knowledge, if she were there when... Jacob came back into the land when he saw it, when he met up with other family, she would have been mentioned. Okay? Good? Everybody good? Everybody ready for chapter 28? Yep. Okay. All right. Chapter 28. So Yitzhak, Isaac called Yaakov. He's listened to his wife. I think maybe he's kind of waking up out of his spiritual lethargy. And he's realizing his wife has some good spiritual input. And he realizes, yes, you're right. We don't want him marrying around here. We, we got a problem. Dad took care of it for me. I need to take care of it for my son. So notice what he does. He calls Jacob. And he condemns him. He says, you shouldn't have stolen that birthright. He reads him the right act. And he says, I'll have nothing to do with you now. Go on your own. You're out. We don't read any of that, do we? There's not condemnation here. And I stress that because I think probably 9 out of 10 or 99 out of 100 messages you'll hear, you're going to hear a whole different tone than what I'll be bringing out. I'm a minority, and that doesn't bother me. I have to bring out what I see from the Word of God. So Isaac calls Jacob, and he blessed him. He commanded him. Now, as he's going to give this blessing, we're going to see. Remember, he was to bless Jacob from the start. It was to be the blessing to the youngest son. So even though he thought he was blessing Esau and he gave it away to Jacob, now he's going to be doing it with his eyes wide open and doing what, what he knows he should have been doing all along, 
did do, quote, accidentally, only it wasn't accidental, but here, here he's going to do what's right. First he tells him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. We can't have you marrying somebody around here. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, to your mother's father. From there, take yourself a wife from the daughters of Levon, your mother's brother. Okay, don't take a wife from the line of Canaan. What's wrong with the line of Canaan? It's not the line of Shem that leads to the Messiah. We go further back and remember how God had the godly line. He had the line of Shem, um, Ham, Ham is the one who disgraced Noah, his father, brought judgment on himself and his progeny. It is even believed that it wasn't just Ham, but it was Ham and his son who did wrong to Noah. And God cursed that line and said that that line would not be a part of the godly line. If you follow that line down, Canaan, Canaan, the Canaanites come out of Ham's line. That's the line that God said, that's the curse line that cannot be part of the Messianic line. It's separate. It's cut off from that line. So since Canaan is through Ham, Jacob has to stay away from that line. He has to stay away from the entire line, and he has to stay in the line that will lead in godliness down to the promised seed, which we know um, speaks of Messiah. So <clears throat> what we see is God is accomplishing his will, in spite of man's fleshly actions. He even turns those actions to accomplish his will. Isaac had been negligent in, in, um, in uh, obtaining wives for his sons, like his parents did for him. So God stepped in, and he's going to see to it that, that Isaac, uh, sorry, Jacob gets the right wife. If you're not going to do right, God will work in spite of you. He will still, his purpose will not be thwarted. And I say that very intentionally because we can carry that all the way into today. If we don't do the right thing, it doesn't mean that God's plan gets ruined. God's plan will still be carried out. We'll miss out on blessing. We may have separate consequences. There may even be punishment involved if it's out of a rebelliousness on our part. But God's plan continues. It's never derailed. So God had planned all along who Jacob's wife would be. Now we're going to see that's what's accomplished. So, in verse 2, he's to go to Padan Aram. Literally, that means the land of Aram, A-R-A-M, the land of Aram, it may be the way you pronounce it. Uh, the Greek is Mesopotamia. <clears throat> that's where Abraham and the family had come out. Look at verse 5 real quick for a moment. It says, Isaac sent Jacob away. He went to Padan Aram to Levon, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob, and Esau. Spells it all the way out. Aramean, Aramean, however you pronounce it, means uh, that it's a person from Aram of the two rivers. Now, if you look <coughs> up, and I didn't think to bring, bring you a map today, but if you call up a map that shows Mesopotamia, it will show the two rivers in Mesopotamia, and that that area in between, Tigris and Euphrates, in that area in between, it was called Padan Aram, the, the um, land, the tableland of Aram, the land between the rivers, all of these are uh, definitions of what these words mean. So we know exactly where he's going. He's going right back to where the family is. Remember, God called Avram out. Avraham left behind idolatry, but there was the truth there. Abraham had truth. He knew to listen and follow the, the one true and living God. And as God took him on his path, he believes in the coming Messiah and it's, a, it's given to him for righteousness. But obviously, his, it wasn't that every other member in his household were worshiping idols or there'd be no one for Isaac to have married. There'd be no one for Jacob to marry. So there was a godly family in this area also. Were they all that way? No. We're going to see Laban is not godly. We're going to see that he's very me, 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 me. What can I get out of it? And that's his motive from the beginning, and it's his motive 20 years later when Jacob finally leaves him. Very greedy. <laughs> very greedy and very me-centric. Um, but it is, there were, Rachel was a good wife for him. Leah in, it also was a good wife for him. We'll get into the two of them and all of that as we move down the line. 
by the way, the, the flat land, the plain, P-L-A-I-N, between Euphrates and Tigris had mountains around it. Haran was situated in there. It was the area that Jacob was to go to. And then he was to take a wife from the daughters of Laban. Laban was his mom's brother, so Uncle Laban, okay? He used to marry somebody in Laban's family. Um, would be marrying your cousin. Today, we don't marry cousins. Back in biblical time, all the way back, it was okay to do that. You've got to think all the way back to Adam and Eve. Who did their kids marry? Each other. They had to marry siblings. Now we're moving a little further out and they can marry cousins, but it takes a while before we get to the point. And God kept the line pure. There wasn't the mongoloid and the other issues, you know, that would come from the closeness of uh, the blood relation that we see it has trouble to this day. So, go. Go get yourself a wifey, Jacob. Okay? Now, Jacob's not a kid. Remember, he's got some age on him. He's middle-aged for what he's going to be. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So if you don't know the age, hold on and we'll find out. All right? Verse 3. May God Almighty bless you. Here's where Isaac is now starting to invoke the blessing upon his son. And immediately he uses the name God Almighty. What he uses is the name El Shaddai. El Shaddai is the nourishing, the sustaining, the providing, the satisfying, the supplying God. That's a whole lot of words, but it takes that many words to cover what Shaddai means. Um, there's, a, there's a story told. Let me, let me just read a bit of this story for you. Um, again, it's a story told. There's a single mother who had heard a biblical financial teacher say, quit looking at your job as the source of your income. Look at your job as only one avenue, one channel that the source El Shaddai uses to bring finances into your life. Begin to teach your children to look to their heavenly father as their source, not the parents. Teach your children. Look to God the Father to provide for you, and in wisdom act as God the Father teaches you. Her little daughter one day told her that she wanted a bike, like all the other children around her had a bike. At first, her mother's reply was, Honey, Mama doesn't have any extra money to buy you a bike. And then she realized what an opportunity she had in front of her, and she said, because she remembered the teacher's words, Let's ask the Lord for a bike. Okay, turn the attention to the Heavenly Father. A few days later, the little gal's mom received a check in the mail payable to her personally. On the way to town to cash the check, they noticed a man placing a bicycle out by the side of the road. The mother stopped the car and asked the man what he was going to do with that bike, and he replied, my daughter's outgrown it, I'm going to sell it. The, the mama asked the man, how much do you want? The man said $25, which just happened to be the amount of the check that she had received that she was going to cash. And so quickly they made the deal and she bought the bike for her daughter by the funds that the father had brought to the family. What a lesson to learn. That's El Shaddai, seeing the need and providing the need. Now I'm not saying every child needs a bike. <laughs> But teaching that child, look to your Heavenly Father. And I don't care if you're a 60-year-old child or a 5-year-old child or a 90-year-old child. Look to your Heavenly Father and see how He will provide your needs when He is your El Shaddai. Because He will. I love my dad. He taught us well. God does not always provide your greeds, but He does always provide your needs. And that's so true. So God's going to provide the need for um, Je uh, Jacob. I've got to get my people right. And Isaac is right to point him to look. Look where this is coming from. It's coming from El Shaddai. Now he could have used the name Elohim. Elohim was the strong God. He could have used the name Yehovah, <coughs> the God who keeps covenant. We often see those names combined, but he chose to use a name where God is speaking about his ultimate power over all. Again, though, he didn't use El Gabor. El Gabor is another name that means Almighty God, but here he's using the name of the one that will be associated with the Messiah, the name of the Mighty God 
who will destroy all of, of God's enemies and rule with a rod of iron. Jacob's going to be coming into position of rulership. I think even in the name, God is showing his look has to be to God the Father, who is the ultimate ruler, who will rule through Jacob to his promised line, and he needs to be in tune with this one who will see to his every need. And will we see in this chapter how God sufficiently meets every one of Yaakov's needs? It is amazing. It's uh, the all-sufficient one, the name used when God promised Isaac to Abraham. Now, Jacob's, uh, Isaac's using this name in promise to his son. And it always, well, I shouldn't say always, but it often, if not always, has to do with that promise line. So, invoking J uh, Jacob's attention on God Almighty, on El Shaddai, this is where it's going to come from. May El Shaddai bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become a multitude of peoples, uh, a company of peoples you may have. Uh, Hebrew says a, an army of nations. May there be many, many, many who come from you. Now, the prophetic utterance that follows Isaac's spiritual perception now, he's finally accepting this is God's choice. This is the line. He's now going to be sharing the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant on his son. He's going to be passing it down. What God promised to Abraham, Abraham blessed Isaac with. Now Isaac is blessing Jacob with. So we're very much going to see in here language very similar to the Abrahamic covenant because this is what God had said. It was to go to Jacob. So Isaac's in the right place spiritually using the right words and blessing his son with the blessing of Abraham, that covenant blessing also. And that's what he says in the next verse too. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you so that you may possess the land where you live as a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. Okay, Jacob is being sent out of that land right now. He's going back to Haran. He's leaving that land of promise. He could have easily thought, I'm losing that blessing. I'm not coming into it. I'm losing it. It's being revoked. He could think that was a consequence of his actions. But instead, what we're hearing is Isaac blessing him concerning inheriting that land. He just said to him here, may he give you the blessing of Abraham and your descendants that you may possess the land where you live as a stranger. They were still strangers and sojourners in the land. So Isaac is giving him that blessing and that encouragement, more than encouragement, that fact that even though you're leaving the land for a time, you're not losing the possession of the land. You are and you will inherit this land because of El Shaddai, because God, who is faithful, keeps his promise. He promised it to Abraham, but he didn't say it'll stop with you, Abraham. He said it's to you and your seed. Is Yaakov not the seed of Abraham? We know he is. He's grandson. We know he's in that line. So at a time when Yaakov could have been concerned, wow, have I lost this? He gets reassured, this is your inheritance. And he gets it by the word of his father, who's now spiritually blessing his son in the way God had told him to all along. So he's finally getting it right. So um, have I done all verse 4? I think I did. Yes, so verse 5. Then Isaac sent Yaakov away. He went to Padan Aram to Levan, the son of Bethuel, the our man, the brother of Rivka, Rebekah, the mother of Yaakov and Esau mother of Jacob and Esau. It's just being spelled all out. Bethuel is Abraham's nephew. He was the son of Nahor, his brother. We read that in Genesis 22, so you can go back up and look and see if I'm right. Genesis 22, verses 20 and 33 tell us that, that Abraham's nephew was Nahor, his brother. When it says he's the our man, if you have in your scripture, he was the Syrian, that was, was translated at times. The Hebrew is our man, and it meant person from between Aram, between the two rivers, like I brought out. The Greeks called them Syrians. Don't mix that up with Syria of today. It's not that he went just north. He goes north and he goes east. Goes into the area that's Iraq, around, you know, that, that area today. So, um, 
actually is further than that area. Sorry, I'm trying to wrap my brain around what I need to say real fast. Next week, if I remember, I'll bring you a map and show you, but I think we all know because we looked at that map to see where Abraham came from in the beginning. Um, and again, my point just, if you're using what came like the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures, it would use the word Syrian. You may have a translation today that used that and put the word Syrian in. It does not mean one from the land called Syria today. It still means that our man, between the Aram of the Two Rivers, the area that the Tigris and Euphrates, um, where we have talked about. Now, notice also one other little detail in those last words. The mother of, and notice it's Jacob first and Esau second. It's the younger before the older. We're seeing Jacob's name put first now because he has that legal position of firstborn. So that's why we see this change and we see his name brought up first and then his brothers instead of the, the order that it normally would be, which would be to put Esau first. Now, with this prayer, with this blessing and Isaac doing it right, and I stress that because we saw Isaac spiritually dim, eyesight dim, showing you was spiritually dim in that he tried to bless the wrong son, God prevented it, now he fully knowing what he's doing, eyes wide open, right with God, he is blessing his son to go out as he should. And this is the last that we will read of Yitzhak in scripture, nothing more recorded until his death is recorded in chapter 35, verses 27 to 29. We'll go look at that real quick, but that's the next time you'll hear us talk about Isaac will be all the way at the time where we're talking about his death. Uh, chapter 35, verse 27, Yaakov, Jacob, came to his, to the, his father Isaac of Mamre of Kiryat Arba, that's Hebron. Hebron is southern Israel, it's near Beersheba, where Abraham and Isaac had resided. Now the days of Yitzhak of Isaac were 180 years. So we know he lived 180. Right now he's, he's um, okay, if Jacob's about, oh, I wasn't going to tell you that yet. All right. I'm, I'm spoiling it, um, and let me get my notes so I say it right to you. Okay, Jacob is about 75, 76. Isaac was 60 when he was born, so Isaac's about 135, and he's going to live to 180. Remember, he lived about 42, 43 more years than when he thought he was dying. So we'll say 40-plus years later is chapter 35, Okay. And Isaac's 180, verse 29, Isaac breathes his last and died and was gathered to his people as an old man of ripe age. And his sons, Esau and Yaakov, buried him. Now, notice Esau's mentioned there first because it's not talking about the line and carrying on. But when we talk about the spiritual, when we talk about the continuation of the line, when we talk about the, the position of firstborn, you'll see Jacob mentioned first. But um, that's the last time that we hear of Isaac, as I said, as we go back to chapter 28 now. We will go on because now we're going to follow on Jacob's journey. We've left Abraham behind, we're leaving Yitzhak behind, and we're moving on down through the line, and we'll go through Jacob's journey and what happens. But little side note, before we get Jacob's journey, we're going to find out about his brother Esau. So <laughs> we have... I lost my whole place. We're in verse 6. Now Esau saw that Yitzhak, Isaac, had blessed Jacob. So he doesn't miss out on the fact it, it's not only was it done in, in, um, in the, the blinding, you know, when, when it, oh goodness, where's my words? Not only was Jacob blessed when Isaac didn't know it was Jacob, but now Isaac, knowing it's Jacob, has blessed him again. And Esau knows this. He knows his brother has received that blessing. And that he was sent away to Padan Aram to take to himself a wife there. So he heard. He heard mom tell dad, hey, I don't want Jacob marrying Hittite women like Esau's done. So what's Esau going to do about this? Um, let's keep reading. He saw that he was going to get a wife and that when he blessed him, he commanded him saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Verse 7. I think I'm ready for verse 7. Let me make sure. Yeah. Okay. Verse 7. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So we're just being brought up to speed that Esau knew what was going on. 
he, he heard it. He knew his brother's been sent out to get a wife and to get a wife from the godly line from the family back in, in Padan Aram. So verse 8, Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. Now he didn't just suddenly awaken to this. The daughters that he had the wives he had married had been giving grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Remember we, we read that earlier, that they were a grief to the parents. So he knows, he knows these Canaanite women are not pleasing to his parents. So he figures, okay, let me do something about that. So Esau, verse 9, went to Ishmael. Now who's Ishmael? Do we remember? Here. Was, yeah, the Abraham, son. Abraham, the son. Right, the son of Abraham and Hagar. Not the godly promised line, not the promised son. God promised Ishmael to bless him, but he was not the blessing, the line that would be carried down, that was Isaac. So Esau goes to that line. He goes to the line of Ishmael, and he married again. Besides the wives that he had, he marries Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Avraham's son, the sister of Nebaot. Now I may be slaughtering those names, forgive me if I am. Um, but let me break it down for you. Marrying a daughter of Ishmael, that's the son of the bondwoman. That would have been kind of like his aunt, right? Uh, yes, that would have been his aunt, yes. Yes, I have to keep my line straight, but yes. Um, and that line, according to Genesis 21, verses 10 and 12, and let's look at that. In that line, that line was not the line of inheritance, the line of promise. Chapter 21 and verse 10, Therefore she said to Abraham, this is Sarah speaking, Drive out this slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. Sarah was saying, get rid of Hagar, get rid of Ishmael, they're making life miserable for my son. They're not in the line of inheritance, I want them out. And verse 12, God told Avraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and your slave woman. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. So, we know very clearly this line of Ishmael with his mama Hagar was not the promised line, was not the line of inheritance. It was an ungodly line. It's the, the, the slave, the bondwoman, it was not the free woman, it was not the, the, the promised one with Sarah. So, Esau thinks he's going to please his spiritually minded father and mother, marrying a third wife. And where does he choose them? Oh, I'll go get a relative. I'll go get one of these over here. Now granted, the, the, the one he married, the grandfather would have been Abraham. Okay, because Hagar had Ishmael, it's one of Ishmael's daughters. Hagar had relations with Abraham, so Abraham is the grandfather. So, yes, he's, he thinks he's doing right because he's marrying that family. But he bypasses the fact that her father, Ishmael, that line was cast out by God. It's not going to make the wrong right. It's not going to make it, oh, it's okay because granddaddy was Abraham. Now, hopefully, and we have no way of knowing, that hopefully because her father, grandfather was Abraham, hopefully they had some moral principles in that line. Hopefully there was somewhat of a belief of God in that line, because we know Hagar believed in God. She, when she was pregnant and having trouble, you know, she, God met her at the well, and she's called the place where God sees me. God, the God who sees me. You know, we know God spoke to Hagar. But she thought another time when, when she thought her son was going to die, and God had an encounter with her. So hopefully this granddaughter of Abraham does have some godly influence in her. That would have been better than the Canaanite land that had no godly influence. I will give that much to Esau. But he's still looking in the ungodly line. He's still not looking in the godly line. He did not marry in the godly line. He didn't follow his brother back to Laban and choose a wife for himself there either. So at best, she might have had some morals and some principles that were more in line with Isaac and Rebecca. But at worst, she still is not going to be a completely godly. If she was, honestly, she wouldn't have been marrying Esau because he wasn't godly. 
So, you know, we just, we just have to call it what it is. Now, in Genesis chapter 36, 3, her name, Mahalath, is called Bishamath. And uh, that's just one and the same. I don't know why the name difference. Maybe like we have first and middle names. And at one point we use our first name. And at another point we use our middle name. I don't know. I just want you to know when you get there, if you see that in the, the genealogical um, tables, is one and the same. Okay, so coming back to chapter 28 because uh, I don't want to confuse us too much. Coming back to, to chapter 28, we read here um, Abr that uh, Mahalath or Bashamath, however we should say the names, that he married, you know, she became his wife. Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, we've already talked about that, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Okay, Nebaioth was Ishmael's firstborn. So he did marry Ishmael's daughter. That makes Abraham the grandfather, just like I've said. That's in chapter 25 and verse 13. I won't look it up, but you can go read it there. So this is how we know for a fact this one was Hagar, Ishmael, his daughter. You know, And Hagar being uh, the bondwoman of Abraham, that's where the relation is. So I think I've made it clear. I hope I haven't made it clear as mud. <laughs> but wouldn't she have been a lot older than him? Uh, let's see. Hagar, Ishmael was 13 years older than Isaac. And it's Ishmael's daughter. So we don't know. We don't know where the married age was. Could have been. But, um, you know, we have to remember some married younger, some married older. Jacob doesn't marry till he's in his 70s. Esau married at 40, married the two wives. But Esau is Jacob's age. If Jacob's 76-ish, you're right around there, then Esau is 76. So, um, so she could have been, you know. Um, well, because they had kids way in their hundreds. Right, so, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like us where you have your kids in your 20s and 30s today, and by the time you're in your 70s, you're not having babies. <laughs> yeah, they had them, but not as old as Sarah. That was miraculous. But... Uh, I don't know. She could have been younger. We don't know how long Ishmael fathered, you know. But since it was his firstborn, you would think there was some age there too. Yeah. I, I don't know if I can find anything out on that. That's okay. By the time I'll up. look, but yeah. Okay, so. More blessed. Yes, bless you. Which is a good thing to say right now because we're coming into more blessing. We're about <laughs> to come into what happens to Jacob once he's departed. Now, we've looked at the fact his earthly father has sent him out in the blessing of the Lord, given him the Abrahamic blessing, blessed him, go, you know, bless him that he's to be fruitful, he's to have the land. Um, what was the third promise? Um, he was going to inherit God's promise to Abraham, the promise of the land, a nation, oh, the blessing itself, okay? So all three have been given to, Isaac, to uh, Jacob by his earthly father, Isaac. Okay, and we're saying Isaac finally was right spiritually, passing the blessing down. Let's see how Jacob's heavenly father looked at Jacob at this time. Because we've been told by many, many who teach these chapters that Jacob was bad, Jacob was deceptive, Jacob just got it all by deceit, and we don't hear that there's, you know, we hear condemnation. It's funny that we don't hear condemnation on Esau and Isaac for not doing what God had said. Esau trying to get what he'd even given away a second time and Isaac knowing better. We don't hear that. But, um, and it opens the door to anti-Semitism, which is why I probably stress it so much today. By the way, the unchosen son, Esau, married in the unchosen line, uh, Ishmael's line. The chosen son will marry in the chosen line. So we just see the two lines, you know, coming down together. God didn't say it's an end of that line, but he just said it's not the chosen line for Messiah to come through. Okay, so Jacob has departed. Now I've already spilled the beans and told you he's about 75, 76 years old. We'll keep talking about that, and we'll see that in just a moment. We'll break that down, why, how I can get to that age. 
Um, and I say 75, 76, we can't be exact. We don't know how long it took him to travel, but he's going all the way back to Levon's house. Anybody remember how many miles? It's a couple of days. It took days. Yeah. It was really at about 400 miles, some even say 450 miles. It was a long distance. Traveling 20 miles a day, which was a lot to travel. Some days I'm sure they could, some days I'm sure they couldn't. But if you, if you did it 20 miles a day, that's at least 20 days, at least. So I'm going to say it took him at least a month and probably, you know, a little longer to make this journey. He'd be stopping along the way to get food and provision. Maybe weather slowed them down. Maybe somebody got a cold and they waited a little bit. You know, we don't know, but it took a little bit of time. Now, how are we getting his age? Follow me to the end if you're confused. Just follow me to the end and I think you'll get it. His son's going to be Joseph. You know, he has many sons, but Joseph. Joseph was 30 years old at the beginning of the seven years of plenty. Remember, <clears throat> Pharaoh has the dream. He sees seven years of plenty, and it's followed by seven years of famine. Okay? So this is Genesis 41, verses 46 to 48. Let me read it because, for me, seeing it helps me understand it, not just hearing it. What chapter? Chapter 41, verses 46 to 48. Okay, we have now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went out throughout the land of Egypt. During the seven years of plenty, the land produced abundantly. So he collected all the food of, the, of the, these seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt, put the food in the cities, he put in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. And it'll go on with the story, but it makes it very clear. Jacob told Pharaoh his dream, told him what it meant. Pharaoh put him in charge and said... Jacob, you mean Joseph. Joseph. Okay. Joseph. Did I say Jacob? I'm yep. sorry. For me. I'm sorry. Joseph, thank you for keeping me on track. <laughs> okay. Joseph stood before Pharaoh. Joseph was able to interpret the dream. Joseph was wise. Pharaoh saw it and said, I'm putting you in charge. So Joseph came up with a grand plan of let's not eat all our plenty in seven years. If we got seven years of famine coming, let's set aside so that we'll have food. You know, we're, we're going to save it for the rainy day, as we would say today. So that's what, what we know happens. So it tells us very clearly he was 30 at the start of that time, seven years of plenty. Okay. Now, Joseph was 39 years old when he revealed himself to his brothers. That's Genesis chapter 45. Go with me to 45. And if you don't know all of these stories in between, just stay with us in Genesis. Um, I'm hitting highlights because most of you, I think, have that background. Genesis 45, starting with verses 4, well, I'll read 4 through 6. Joseph said to his brothers, now his brothers had sold him off into slavery. As far as they knew, he was as good as dead. They don't know that he's this one. What chapter are you in now? 45. Yes, 45, verse 4. They don't know he's the one that's been in charge in Egypt here. So Joseph's now going to reveal himself to his brothers. He says, please come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold to Egypt. Now, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me ahead of you to save lives. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. So obviously, right now, they're in the second year of famine. That means the seven years of plenty have passed, and there have been two years of famine here, okay? So if he's 30 plus seven years of plenty, he's 37. If they're set two years into famine, he's 39, okay? I think I've got you all at this point. He's 39. Now, Jacob, the father, not Joseph now, okay? Jacob, he's 130 when he comes down into Egypt for food because his son's been revealed, and they told, he told, uh, Joseph told his brothers, go back and get dad, bring him down, okay? That's Genesis chapter 47. Skip with me from 45, go to 47. 
and we'll look in chapter 47, starting with verse 7. We'll read a couple of verses there. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob, presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many years have you lived? How old are you, old guy? <laughs> and Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my living abroad are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during their days of living abroad. So he says, well, I'm 130 years old. I kind of laugh because I think maybe Pharaoh said, how old are you, old geezer? And he says, well, yeah, I'm old. I'm 130, but I'm not as old as my fathers lived. They lived even older than this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I may be reading into that, but that's kind of how I hear it, okay? So Jacob tells Pharaoh, I'm 130. That's two years into that famine time. So when Joseph was 39, Jacob was 130. We've got that verified from those two chapters now, okay? Um, was that 140 or 130? 130. 130, 130 okay? And Joseph was 39, okay? So if, if Jacob is 130, you take away 39, let's just round it to 40, okay? 130 minus 40 is 90, okay? So Jacob would have been 90 when Joseph was born. If Joseph is 39 now, and that makes Jacob 130 now, then when Joseph was born, rounded off 39, 40 years, if Jacob's 130, 40 years earlier Jacob was born, then Jacob, I'm, I'm sorry, Joseph was born, then Jacob gave birth, quote, his wife did, <laughs> when he was 90, 91, somewhere right around in there, okay? That's how old he is when his son Joseph is born, okay? Now, when Joseph was born, Joseph wasn't the first thing that happened when Jacob goes to stay with Laban, okay? We're going to read about what happens. Jacob is with Laban 14 years before Joseph is born, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're going to be backing up again, all right? We know that, that Jacob is, and we'll round it, we'll say he was 90 when Joseph was born, and now we have to back up 14 more years because we know that, that Joseph wasn't born right when Jacob got to Laban. Jacob works for Laban 14 years before Joseph is born. So if he's 90 when, when Joseph is born, he's been working 14 years for Laban, then how old was he when he got to Laban? 90 minus 14, approximately 76 years old. Wow. Okay? Wow. So he's around 76. I'm not saying it's exact, but right around that, when he meets and falls in love with Rachel, gets Leah, Leah then gets Rachel, 14 years of working for his uncle Laban, and he gives birth to, or his wife gives birth to Joseph. That's how we get the age. So he wasn't a 20-year-old when he took off, but when you know that he's going to live to 100 and, uh, 180, approximately, we know that he's like middle-aged, you know, that he's got time, okay? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> you have to think it all through, um, but it's there. Um, and he began to serve Laban, I didn't bring out that, but Jacob began to serve Laban a month after he arrived in Padan Aram. That's in chapter 29, verses 14 to 18. So about half his life has gone by when he goes and lives with Uncle Laban, and marries the gals, and has the kids. Okay? So we're in chapter 29 still? Uh, we're in chapter 28. 28 still, yes. Yes. Okay, and we're going to back up to verse, I think we're in verse 10. i got to get back to the chapter myself. Uh, we are in chapter 28. I think I've read it. out from Beersheba and went that's where we're starting there you go in verse 10 okay and we're going to come into a time i'm almost i'm not sure how i'm going to split this but we'll we'll go on and just see where we get because i want to give the whole picture when i can um but let's see what happened again i'm pointing you to that how do we see god viewing jacob at this time 
Verse 10, Then Yaakov departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He started out from where he was living, and he heads for Haran. Verse 11, It happened upon a particular place. Sorry, he happened. He happened upon a particular place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of the place and made it a support for his head and lay down in that place. Okay, a little later we're going to find out the place he came to is going to be called Baal or Bethel. It's going to be called House of God, but at this point it's called Luz, L-U-Z. How do I know this? I cheated. I looked ahead. I read ahead. Verse 19 in our chapter. Then he named the place Bethel, Bethel, but previously the name of the city had been Luz, L-U-Z, okay? Baal, Bethel, or Luz, whichever you want to call it, is about 12 miles north of Jerusalem, which is about then a three-day journey from Beersheba, from where Jacob left, okay? Because there's about six, 50 to 60 miles between what was Beersheba and what was called Luz, at that time okay we, we just read that he left Beersheba and uh, and we read let me show you in chapter 21 and verse 33 just so you know I'm not making all this up chapter 21 and verse 33 we a get a Genesis we get this distance 21 33 Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba there he called on the name of the Lord the everlasting God so we remember when Abraham was in Beersheba we know that Isaac and the wells, all of that was Beersheba. Isaac's still living in that area, so we know where it is when, when um, Jacob goes out. Now look at chapter 22, the very next chapter. Chapter 22, and we want to look at verse 2 and then verse 4. Verse 2 says, Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Yitzhak, go to the land of Moriah, Offering, you know, as the burnt offering. Okay, so Abraham went from Beersheba to Moriah. Okay, and verse 4 says, On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and he saw the place from a distance. Now we know Moriah is one of the mountainous areas that surrounds Jerusalem. We know that Abraham built an altar. Um, if we go back to chapter 12 and verse 8, we read that. Chapter 12 and verse 8, Genesis 12 and verse 8 says, Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel, the east of, of Luz. He pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord. So all of this, when we put all this together, and if I lost you, just trust me in the geography, we know that Beersheba is about 50 miles south of Jerusalem, and we know that Bethel is about 20 miles north. So we've got about a 60-mile distance that Jacob has traveled when we go back to chapter 28, okay? I stress this again because everybody will tell you the very first night out, Jacob has his dream. Okay, if you know the dream, that's what we're building too. It wasn't his first night out. It was probably his third night out. He probably had traveled about 60, 62 miles. He could not have done that in a day, but he could easily do that in three days. He would have started out with plenty of provision, plenty of energy. He's on his journey, and he probably went out. I find this highly significant, and that's why I'm bringing it out. I love this. Third day. Israel, the nation of Israel, is three days out of her home when God reveals himself to her in the Messiah. Let me show you Hosea 6.2, okay? Um, in fact, we'll start with verse 1. Hosea, Hosea, one of those little prophet books that maybe by the time you find it, I've already read you the scripture so you can just listen if you want. It says, come, let's return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Hosea is speaking prophetically. God is going to allow captivity to happen to his people, suffering. They uh, suffered punishment, consequences for their turning their back and not being obedient to God. But he says they're going to return to the Lord. 
They're going to return on the third day. He's going to raise them up, and then they're going to um, live before the Lord in the way that they should. So, three days when that happens. Now, Second Peter, Second Kepha, chapter three and verse eight. Let me read it for you, and then make my comment. Second Peter, Second Kepha, his second book that, that Peter Kepha wrote, chapter three and verse eight says. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, years, and a thousand years like one day. Now, if we let Scripture work with Scripture, then three days that Israel's going to be out of the land and not knowing her God, and then God's going to bring her back, we can easily look at that as thousand-year periods, and we have the timing to be right. We have that this is, when they came back into the land, is fulfillment of prophecy. They've been out of the land two days, about 2,000 years. They returned to their land on the third day. In that 1,000 years, they should know that the Lord is their God. And I fully believe that before that third day will be completed, they will know that the Lord is their God. They will know that the Lord has put Israel back in her land, he has put his kingdom authority on that land. He has raised up the temple and the worship of all the nations coming through Israel to worship the one true and living God, the God of Israel, on the third day. Very interesting, is it not? Yep. And if you start watching, I have taught, and it's not complete, but I, the Lord opened my eyes to begin to sing third day in Scripture. Um, probably been about a year now that I've really been studying it and I brought out things that happened on that third day and I know I haven't seen it all yet I'm still in other scriptures as I'm reading it and all of a sudden it jumps out of the page here's another third day it's another third day here's another third day and because I don't want to get into our our dream that he has I'm going to give you just a couple things about why that's so important on that third day I'm not going to give you everything by any means, but God speaks about days and days being important. Great example. Yeshua himself said, Avraham saw my day and, it, and believed, you know, and it was, it was counted to him. Um, he rejoiced in it. He believed in it. It was his righteousness. How did Avraham see Yeshua's day? We know he saw it through the gospel and the stars being revealed to him, but that was going to be a couple thousand years later Abraham wasn't alive and the, the Pharisees called Yeshua out and said Abraham saw you you're not even 50 years old Abraham's a couple thousand years old he's dead we know where his his burial site is we still know today you know they tried to call him out but of course the Lord was speaking prophetically when we talk about our Shabbat the day of Shabbat we study and we recall every Shabbat that our God is master creator of the entire earth and that he brought them out of Egypt. That's what they're always to remember and always to be focusing on. So you've got the, like the two days, the day of creation, the day of being brought out of Egypt. What do we see on the third day? It's a picture of death and resurrection. Yeshua being the redeemer planned before the foundation of the world he we see the slavery and the death in egypt we see them brought out we see the death and the resurrection of yeshua being brought out that third day seems to always reference in some way yeshua his death his resurrection the third day resurrection especially conquering of death coming back to life so we see a picture in third day of resurrection that's what I'm trying to say if I'm not saying it well we see that 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 seems to be the significance and there's something else I want to bring out because we've already had it in Genesis I'm skipping all kinds of other things that I could show you third day of creation remember we had our days of creation on the third day we have the plants yielding seed bringing forth life on the third day you don't have that first day second day you have that for the first time presented on the third day where in essence it was like it wasn't alive and now it's come out of death it's come into life and we know that god uses the signs the days the seasons and all that he has told us 
that that's what he is, what they're for, is to be symbolically, to be spiritually teaching us. And it's very interesting, on day two in creation, God doesn't say it was good. In day two, you have moving um, over the, the waters, over the face land, bringing out the dry land. You have that completed when out of the dry land comes the produce, the, the, yield, the trees yielding seed, the vegetation, all that coming forth. Again, life out of death on that third day. And it's on that day that God blessed it twice. That said it was good two times. To the point that Israelis who are following the scriptures to the nth degree, trying to, the religious, the, the ones that really, you know, are plugged into this, they marry on the third day of the week because it's the only day God blessed twice and they want their marriage blessed twice. <laughs> they want that strong so they even look at that. Day three also, we have Aaron's rod that budded. Day one, we had Korah's rebellion. Korah came up and said, hey, Moses, you got it all. It's all in your family. You, you appointed yourself leader. You appointed Aaron as high priest. Uh -uh, it's all family. And we know that he, the earth opened up and swallowed him up because his rebellion was against God. The second day, we have the people grumbling and complaining again. And they're violating God's, God's, what God had put into motion. God had chosen who the leaders were. So day two, we have the, the grumbling, we have the discontent, and we have God instruct the 12 tribes. Take a leader, take a, a, a tree limb, a rod. I'll call it a rod. Put the name of your tribe on it. Put those into the temple, into the tabernacle. Sorry, they didn't have the temple. Into the tabernacle. And the one that we see life is my choice. You'll know who I've chosen. Okay? So, I'm going to prove to you whether Aaron is my choice or not. Did Moses choose him or did God choose him? And on the third day, that dead stick, that dead rod, had blossomed. It had come to life. It, it was almonds. It not only had sprouted life, it had blossomed, and it had developed fruit. It had almonds on it. Wasn't it, was it the rod also put in, weren't they all put into the ark? Not all were put, they were put before the ark. Mm -hmm. And the other 11 sticks were still dead sticks on the third day. The Aaron's, God's choice, had bought, bedded, had shown new life, life out of death. And we know that that goes on even with the, the almonds and all representative of life springing out of death, a picture of salvation for us. So even in that, just those few little things give you a taste for third day, speaking of resurrection, speaking of life out of death, and that's our backdrop to the third day that Jacob's going to have this amazing dream. So just a little tidbit, I could give you more, but I'd have to give you a whole hour lesson or hour and a half or whatever it took me to teach that. And like I say, I told the people at the end of that, part one. As the Lord shows me more, I'll give you part two. <laughs> so it's amazing. Yes, Roger. You can see as Moses walked uh, walk around, he's munching on almonds, <laughs> eating the almonds. <laughs> it, it certainly <laughs> shut the mouths of them saying that uh, it was... Moses doing it wasn't God's doing. Now God had chosen leadership and he had put them in to place. So um, how far can I get in the next couple of minutes? I'm obviously not going to touch the dream. I'm going to tell you come back. Dream is fascinating how much it tells us. Um, and so I'll probably finish with verse 11 here. Uh, it happened that particular place. He spent the night there because the sun had set. Okay, he came to a designated place. He just happened to come to a place where his grandfather had built an altar there. Just happened to be at that place. He was third day out. Um, I've already given you, you know, the, the revelation of, of what we see for Israel and that, and then the stone. Okay, I think that's where I'm at now. Um, yeah, he took one of the stones of the place and made it a support for his head and lay down in that place. And I hear so many times people say, Here's his punishment. He doesn't get to have a soft pillow. Oh, He's God. sleeping on a hard rock. <laughs> so why would he pick a hard rock? Because, because there weren't the such a thing back. as pillows. <laughs> they didn't have the creature comforts that we have. 
They, they were used to living out as nomads and as journeying. This was nothing strange. He would have picked a smooth one, not a bumpy one. And he probably took one of his robes or, you know, a... a, a, a how yeah. would you like to have a pillow fight with him? <laughs> yeah, would you like to have a pillow fight with him? <laughs> uh, I, I think, think so. I think that uh, I'm trying to think of something clever to say, and I can't. But, uh, I'll just say uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't be rocked to sleep. <laughs> there you go. I'll say. You um, but it, it wasn't something. Uh, this is a strange punishment from God. He knew what to do. You know, if you go camping, you can go with an RV today and have all the creature comforts of home. And those who really like to camp will tell you you haven't camped yet. That you don't know what camp is till you're roughing it, till you're out there. Mm -hmm. Well, of course he's out there in this this ruggedness, but he was a man that this was not an ordinary to him. He knew what to do: find a smooth stone, put your cloak down, something to, to soften it a bit, and he went to sleep. Doesn't say he was restless, doesn't say he couldn't sleep, no. He's going to dream. You dream when you're asleep, not when you're thrashing the bed. <laughs> so, and our word um, for the sleep here, Vayishkov, means he laid down to sleep. Now, when he laid down to sleep, in essence, we can see in that a type of death. We even say they went to sleep when they died. We use that expression. In that, what we're seeing is that Yaakov, Jacob, he is helpless, he's prostrate. Let's try prostrate. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> prostrate. Yeah, difference. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there's a huge difference. I'm sorry, I'm moving right on. He is a picture of death before God. Israel as a nation, the picture of death before God. Remember, two days out, Hosea said they're two days out of the land, but out of the third day they come to life. The third day they spring back into life. The third day is a picture of the age of grace. We're in that time now. We see Israel coming back to life. Even in Jacob's sleeping is a picture of death, and now we're going to see life come out of death. That's our backdrop to this miraculous dream that he has. Let me close with Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37. And we'll look at several verses here. We'll start with 4 and 5 at first. And this is Hezekiel speaking. God, He says, God speaking to him again. God said to Ezekiel, prophesy over these bones. Ezekiel seeing a whole field of just dead bones. Okay? And God saying, prophesy over these bones. Say to them, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. Behold, I'm going to make breath enter you so that you may come to life. I will attach tendons to you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, put breath in you so that you may come to life, and you will know that I am the Lord. Now, do you remember what Hosea said? On the third day, they would know their God. Ezekiel seeing dead bones. Jacob is asleep as in death, but he's going to come back to life because God is going to breathe life into those dead bones. Ezekiel, can these bones live again? Yes, they can live again. God will put life back into them, and in that life what will spring forth is worship to their God because they will know he is our God and he has put them in their land. Israel has come back into her land. She has not come back into the spirit of God in her, in her land. She does not know as a whole that God is her God. The majority of people in Israel are still living in rebelliousness to their God. They're still suffering consequences because of that. But Israel will know in third day resurrection, the same way that we see for Jacob, the same as prophesied through Ezekiel and through Hosea, they will be, the, the Spirit of God will breathe back into them and they will become a living nation who knows who her God is. And we will see that fulfilled. That's Revelation 19. That's the Lord stopping the battle of Armageddon, stopping all the enemies of Israel, and bringing that spiritual into the millennial kingdom. Because that's what it will start with, is with the spiritual believers who looked up and said, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The believers, they see the one whom they, they had pierced. They mourn for him as one mourns for their only son. They realize 
oh my, you are our God. You are a Messiah, and their faith is in Messiah, and he brings them into his land of promise with all those blessings that he's promised Israel. He will finally be able to pour out on her, and she will be living because the breath of God's been put in her, and the whole world, not just Israel, but the whole world will know he is God. Right now we have a little nation. We have a nation that is on in war and on the verge of more war and has many nations around her far bigger and far more powerful that want to come against her. And I'm telling you, it's not yet the Battle of Armageddon. We've got time in here of things that have to happen first, so I know it's not yet. But I don't fear Israel losing today. Sadly, lives are being lost today. But Israel as a nation will survive this because God said it. But it, this gives us just a snapshot taste of what it will be like when you get to the end of seven years of tribulation, where God says, if I didn't come back now, there would be no flesh left alive, where there is war facing the entire earth, not the, the Middle East, everywhere. Yes, the Middle East, but everywhere. What we're seeing is one little area, and look how bad it is and how frightful it is. Israel, wake up and know your God. No, she will be saved because God promised. Not because she's deserving, but because of his grace and his love and his mercy. Because he's faithful to his word. That's what we're going to see. We're going to go through this. We're going to come out when we will finally come. And I don't mean us when I'm talking about the second coming. But as we study Jacob, we're going to see. God always has his hand on Israel and brings her to that spiritual life. Sadly, not everyone will come to believe that our hearts cry in our prayer even now, especially for those who will lose their lives in the next coming days. Lord God, let them learn you are Messiah. Let them receive you as Savior. Let them put their head on the rock of their salvation and let them come into their eternal abode with you when they leave this life. Because only while they're here can the choice be made. You know what's really sad is even if the Biden's not doing nothing, others are, other missionaries, other churches like Copeland said along, they raise so much money with much prayer because they got missionaries over there and God's that governor using. from Florida, I said, yeah. if he don't, we will do it. God's using people Everybody, today. Everybody, but yes, yeah. yes, and just pray for more and pray for protection because God will keep yeah. His hand ultimately on Israel. But what a perfect timing to be studying this. Come back next week. This is an amazing dream, and just because I don't want to leave it in case someone doesn't make it back, when I said to you, how does God send? Jacob out, does it go out in consequence and condemnation and judgment and you made your bed, now lie in it, go suffer, or have a hard rock for a pillow? No. We're going to see he has a wonderful night's sleep. We're going to see that his earthly father blessed him and this dream is going to show him the blessings of his heavenly father upon him and the promises he has for him. This is not a son being child corrected in condemnation. Remember, Jacob had the right motive. He had the wrong, he did, he, his, his actions were wrong, but his heart was right. He wanted to be in that position of carrying on the spiritual line to Messiah and leading the family spiritually. So I don't see condemnation from his father in heaven. I see an amazing, amazing dream. What God says to him in the picture of this dream, wow, come back next week. <laughs> Dora? Well, I was just going to say it is... For, for us too, because we say, oh, yes. how awful, how awful, yes. but nobody's turning to God. And that's what he's saying. Right. You got me out while you can. Right. Amazing. Yes. Absolutely the parallel. Yes, we can take it to heart. And for any who are out there in rebellion, they can never swallow the lie. Well, I blew it. God can't or won't save me now. Or, you know, I can't ever get right with God. No, he always is holding that out. He's always, he's the father looking for the prodigal son to come back. He's always got that door open. So if you've got loved ones that are out sowing their wild oats, keep praying. Don't give up. God is faithful. God knows how to bring them back. 
and prayerfully they'll turn to his correction and come back and they'll be blessed because that's our God. None of us deserve it. None of us deserve salvation. I, I was, whatever scripture I was reading this morning, I was, that was coming to mind again. You know, there's nothing I did to deserve my relationship with the Lord. There's nothing I did. He did it all. And he did it because he is a God who loves. loves He's it. not a God with a club. Oh, good, I can whack you. I can, you know, let me zap and that's the end of you. No, no, we see long-suffering, grace, mercy. And instead of, as Hamas has trained their people, let me go out and murder as many as I can, God gave his son who willingly laid down his life that we might have eternal life. Amazing grace. Did you know? Amazing I, God. I, I just heard from Flashpoint, there's a church in Texas that they were showing all these children, like soldiers, I'm not sure if of, of, the, of a cult, but they had hundreds of children lined up of all ages, marching and saying the word, and you know, we're a soldier, and brainwashing these children in Texas. I'm was shocked that we had a church that was it's doing here. that. It's here. It's not just on foreign yeah. soil. No, Sadly, it's here. it's here. I didn't know that. Yeah. Sadly, it's here. The, the, um, there are Nazis in our land, in our backyard, literally. They brainwash their children. They raise them <coughs> in that hate and all. But God knows how to reach even individuals in that. And we have the stories to prove it, where God has miraculously. Those that are underage... God does not judge them. They were too young to understand. He does not judge them. They have to be of age of accountability. That's why we see the, the generation that died off in the wilderness, the children didn't suffer that consequence. They had to grow up. There was a period of time while their parents died off, but then they got to go into the land. And God knows. And my heart bleeds for the innocent little children on both sides of this war. The Hamas is... a oh, they are terrorists, they care nothing about life, they care nothing about the, the lives that they are surrounding them about so that the innocent get killed. But God knows those precious little souls too. And that doesn't minimize it. I grieve, I cry, and I pray I hold back this evil. But I'm thankful to know the little ones are ushered right into the presence of the Lord. They are not held accountable because of their leaders evil evil but uh let's close in prayer because i'm way past i thought i was going to close at 3 30 today i thought wow you're all going to be shocked and here we are <laughs> but may I encourage you today we are living in a dark time we're living in a time that i cannot understand on american soil how they can defend terrorist activity such as we have seen in video seen in live stream know for a fact and how they can defend that and, and then call out the other for trying to protect or trying to stop it from happening. It's, it's such an upside down world. It is calling evil good. It is calling everything that is of God wrong and everything that is of Satan right. we got to pray for the colleges. The, kid, uh, the kids don't yes. understand about what's the, going on. The, the kids that are touting this need to be somehow have their and only by god is there can their minds be opened yeah but they they're believing it they're receiving yeah. it that they, they've got to think for themselves their minds i hope can still be reached there are those only god knows where that mind is sealed or seared but we just got to pray against it um it, it's just heart sickening um, and again i would say that same thing if it wasn't jew and arab if it was, who do I want to pick on? Who can, who can I say? I, I mean, it's human rights. It's humans. It doesn't matter who it is. It's wrong. I don't want to say it's dead wrong, but it's dead wrong. But let's close in prayer. Because our God will right the wrong. Oh, did you hear what, what the, was it Hezbollah or Hamas said that... Um, the difference between the Jewish people and them is that Jewish people love life and they love death because they want to be mar martyred so that they can 
get all those promised blessings that they won't get. And sadly, that's true, and that's what they are taught. They're not taught to value life. They're taught to value death and getting glories afterward. And when they wake up in an exact opposite of what they've been promised, <coughs> wow, what a shock for them. Golda Meir set up best, and I'll close with this and pray, and then we can open a conversation. But she said, you know, in time maybe we can learn to forgive the Arabs for killing our children. But it's even harder for us to forgive you for making us kill your children. When the Arabs love their children more than they hate the Israelis, then there will be peace. That was a mouthful that was said early, early 70s or before, maybe even late 60s, it is still ringing true. It was resonating in my ears, and then I heard it picked up by media here um, just the other day, and I thought, yeah, that's exactly what was in my mind, too. Pray for their eyes to be opened, for them not to swallow the lie. Life is precious, every life. God loved the world, died for the world. Lord God, thank you for mercy, for grace, for love, unconditional, not because we've deserved, not because we've earned, and not because we can keep it that way, but you being who you are. You are a God of love. Lord, we know that the enemy of you is sowing hatred and lies and indoctrinating at young ages and, and warping little minds to believe that, that, it's, that to kill is right. Lord, we pray for the rescue of those who are, are not so far gone that cannot be brought back. We pray for the safety of Arab and Jew in Israel even right now. Lord, we pray again, hold back this evil. Stop the evil, Lord. And in this time of such inner, external turmoil, Lord, let them seek for peace. Because only in the Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, can peace be found. Lord, let that reign. Let them hear and know the God of peace who loves them so that he died for them, rose from them, and has promised them eternal life. And again, we pray, may more be saved than life lost in this battle that's going on now, this war, Lord. And may you be glorified in how we praise and we thank you for our each individual salvation. We know we didn't deserve it. And all we can do is, is praise you, thank you, say hallelujah, shout it to the heavens that the earth might hear. For God so loved the world. Thank you for loving each one of us as we put our name in that verse and know you died for us. You rose from the dead for us. You live for us and you bring us into the abundant life. Thank you and we praise you. Thank you for being a faithful God a God who we can trust, a God who does not change, a God who keeps his word, a God who is faithful, the only God, the only one true and living God, the God of Israel. Again, praise you, thank you, hallelujah, in Jesus' name.